after all, though, this is about people who can lose 10 or 20 pounds sensibly. If we could, if we had the discipline, we wouldn't be fat to begin with. Right. Well, what people uh, find appealing is when I say that in a lot of ways, their problem is exactly like drug addicts. They have self-destructive habits that just keep coming back. It's not sensible. It's not sensible to lose 100 pounds and find yourself gaining 10, 20, and 30 and keep going. But you know what? Drug addicts do the same thing. They go into treatment, and when they relapse, they use more drugs than they ever used before. Because in the back of their mind, they know they're going to have to go back into treatment again. And I think the dieters do the same thing. They're going to binge out, they and know. they know they're going to have to go back on a diet again. Take That's it. the dieting mentality. Kate <laughs> dropped 60 pounds on a liquid diet and has maintained her weight loss for six months. I want to be healthy. I want to live a long life. I want to break the mold in my history. People die young in my family. And I'm determined. Both women credit this man with helping them keep the weight off. We know how to lose weight. Every person with a weight problem is a certified expert on weight loss. Right? Everybody knows how to lose it. Now let's talk about why don't we know how to keep it off. We don't know how to shape behavior change. To shape it step by step, slowly. Dr. Philip Sinakin is a psychiatrist who deals with addictions. He's written a book called After the Fast. Sinakin says whether it's a liquid diet or not, 95% of us are going to gain back all that lost weight within 18 months. No, could stick with a diet like this. No one. Food should not be the central thing in life, and unfortunately chronic dieting tends to make it the central thing because it's the thing you can't have. And the, the more you're focused on what you can't have, the more you tend to want it. Recently, Oprah's admitted 17 of those 67 pounds have crept back. I think she's made some very good points when she said, look, I think the weight loss goal I set for myself was too low. I'm 17 pounds up. I want to lose those seven and, and remain 10 pounds up. After you've done everything, if you're finding yourself unable to maintain that weight, set your goal a little higher. Take an extra belt size. Take an extra dress size. Take an extra 10, 15 pounds and make your life easier. Dieting has become a national obsession. The experts call it fat madness. Fat madness is, is an insane preoccupation with food, your body, and your weight. It's, it's a a completely disproportionate uh, concern about physical appearance where actually your self-worth is equated with your physical appearance. The obsession apparently starts early in life. A recent study found that 74% of 10-year-old girls had already dieted by the time they reached the fourth grade. We're all taught to crave, especially women are taught to crave a body that's under uh, ideal body weight. A 5 foot 8 inch tall, 125 pound model is approximately 25 pounds below the midpoint ideal body weight for her height. And yet that's a typical weight for a model. And of course the media goes beyond that then and equates that body shape with happiness and sex and achievement and love and, and everything else that we all want in life. Only the people in a true state of biological depression will benefit from antidepressant medication. That antidepressant medication coupled with, uh, as you said, this dual addiction uh, uh, you treat them uh, coexisting at the same time? Well, that's one of the great challenges in the treatment of substance abuse is to uncover those people who do have a dual diagnosis, who do have a psychiatric problem at the same time. One of the, one of the reasons that's such a challenge is because substances themselves create psychiatric problems. Exactly. That was my next question. Sure. You can get paranoid psychosis from cocaine. Uh, you can get very severe depression from alcohol. But we're learning through studying these diseases, for example, that alcoholics typically will get over their depressive symptoms within two to four weeks after cessation of alcohol. If they remain severely depressed longer than that, then you should uh, strongly consider the use of antidepressant medication. Well, assuming you're going to be successful, and I'm sure anything you put your mind to, you're going to do. So what will the mayor have to do to keep that weight off once he gets it off? Well, he's going to have to do some work to figure out what's been the problem in the past. And sometimes you need some help with that, because most people are not necessarily aware of all that they do that cause them to gain the weight back. That's why I really recommend that people take a hard look at how they eat. Not just what they eat. You know, most diets are, are much more concerned with what they eat. But how you eat really can help you keep the weight off and also 
to be able to eat more of the food that you like. You cannot have forbidden foods and, and uh, not gain the weight back. So there's no such thing as, as a forbidden food. It's just a matter of how... There can't be. What I've learned from working with I addicts, want a pound of chocolate right this minute. You don't have to eat a pound <laughs> if you just eat a, a reasonable portion whenever you want it. just want to comment. I think it should, the point should be made that as this illness progresses, uh, eventually it becomes a, a totally isolated illness where you don't want to be around other people. You're happy to be alone in a room with a locked door, nothing going on. You don't need television, radio, or anything, just you and your cocaine. And one of the, effect, the impact on sex is that you don't want to have sex because you don't want to share your cocaine with somebody else. And if mm. you're going to have sex with somebody, you have to share some of your Did supplies. Did I learn from you uh, that there's something like a cocaine bunny? What's that? Somebody? <laughs> what is that? Well, I if, have if never you're heard meaning what I think you're meaning, <laughs> what is that? as I recall, uh, those are young, uh, young ladies who uh, will happily be around and do whatever you want to do, sexually or otherwise, as long as you keep the cocaine coming. What about the test that they did with the, the rat and the uh, monkey, where they uh, gave them options? Options, yes. yeah. About the food. food. Yeah, tell us about that. Well, they, they gave uh, monkeys options uh, and rats between food, sex, and cocaine, and they would basically use cocaine until they died. <laughs> this is showing <laughs> something about the power of that drug. <laughs> I might also mention that uh, the more powerful the, the high, we, we, you talked about free base at the beginning, I didn't get a chance to talk about that. That's the smokable form of cocaine. Crack is also free-based cocaine. It delivers a very rapid, intense amount of drug to the system. It gets to the brain in three to four seconds. Gives you the most intense high of any delivery system, more than, than IV. When people are free-based, and they talk about the fact that they, 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 they get into very kinky thoughts about sex and get into very uh, exotic and different types of sexual encounters. And like you said, the, the cocaine bunnies. By the way, this can also be, I don't know if there's a name for it, but, but males can also... Be bought for, be bought for uh, cocaine. Um, before we break, let me give you all the telephone number. 1-800-COCAINE is a number. But it's very hard for an addicted person to, as you say, to, to deny this particular drug that we're... Uh, well, how are you just really saying that, that one would think that you would be just too frightened to continue? Well, the paranoia is really state-dependent. Uh, people go into a state of paranoid psychosis. What he's saying is that he was... Basically, out of touch with reality, there was no evidence that the police. FBI was outside your door. Mm -hmm. That any sound you hear, you believe, is, is the police. The okay. scariest story I had was one patient who used to take a rifle, get in his army fatigue, a hunting knife, bar the door, and climb underneath the kitchen table before he would do his cocaine. And God forbid anybody should come to that door. He was really having fun. Yeah, yeah, he was having a great time. Yeah. It, it reaches an irrational proportion, and obviously... Uh, for somebody who is under scrutiny and there is evidence uh, that you're being watched, to go and use that drug then goes beyond any kind of rationality. But that is not, it does not mean that you're, you're out of touch with reality in between. Once you're not intoxicated anymore, you come back to a normal state, but you have physical withdrawal symptoms that drive you to the drug, and that driving you to the drug is also an irrational feeling. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I have to live up to certain expectations. Yeah. Well, Did Debbie and I were talking, right? she still doesn't feel like she's reached the goal. She's still yeah. she's kind of harassing herself about a final 20 pounds. What? You still want to lose 20? Right. Do you think of yourself as heavy now? Oh, yes. Now, that's common, though. That to, is common. To be very thin and still well, think of yourself as heavy. One of the reasons heavy. we saw were the models who were, who were uh, right. came out yeah. before showing. We were talking to them. They're 5'10", they weigh 120 pounds. They're, they're off the scale. They're off the ideal body weight scale below. And yet this is the standards that we try to live up to. This is some of the brainwashing that you have to overcome to begin to like yourself for exactly who you are. I've recommended to Debbie, let it be. She said those last 20 pounds might be the hardest 20 pounds she ever tries to lose. There's a certain biology that she's fighting against. Yeah. She's doing just fine right now. Learn to incorporate the food that you like. Learn to eat everything, by the way. You have to learn to eat everything. I, I told Robin, Robin had looked at my book, and she tried the five-bite idea, which is that you try five bites of your forbidden food at first and let it go. And you walk back, what, 15 minutes later, and you lost interest in it. Right, I didn't, I didn't have it. No, we don't I, do that as a rule. I feel very proud of myself when I could do that. Do you, are you... Uh, Dr. Schnecken, the, the president has, er, is urging uh, insurance companies all across the country to cover drug treatment in, the, in their policies. Um, do you think this will work? Do you think the insurance companies will go along with this? That's a hard one to answer. Uh, certainly, insurance companies are recognizing that drug treatment has been eating up a lot of their dollars. And uh, at the current time, uh, seem to be more invested in, in finding ways to reduce coverage for drug treatment because of the nature of addiction itself, which, which frequently leads to relapses. 
it's difficult to spend a lot of money on a, a treatment program only to find the person turning around in a week or a month or even a year and, and, and ending up back on drugs again. Doctor, would you like to see harsh penalties on drug users, even the casual users? I think what's important to do is to motivate the addict for treatment, even the casual user. It's very important that we recognize that the sooner we can catch somebody in the process of addiction and growing into addiction, the better chance we have of intervening positively. If we can create a penalty that can be used as a leverage in some way to get the patient into treatment, motivate them to stay in treatment, and try to keep them off drugs in that very vulnerable period just after they leave treatment, I think that would be a good way to use these penalties. Well, now let's meet a guy who will show us how to stay bikini slim after that liquid diet and keep that knockout shape forevermore. Please welcome Dr. Philip Sinaikin. He's a psychiatrist and the author of the book, After the Fast. After the Fast. Hi, how you doing? How do you do? All right. This is really important. Have a shave. Uh, Have a shave. How many people good. do you think, how many people go on the liquid diet every year? Well, those figures are a little hard to come by, but uh, we do know that 250,000 people, for example, have been on Metafast, and that's only the third largest liquid fasting company. This is a $5 billion a year business, actually. $5 billion? Yes, we should get into that no. right now. I mean, Everybody wow. is getting into it. As but I guess fact. the biggest problem, though, is that I don't know what the numbers are, but an awful lot of the people that go on that, and they lose all that weight, and then they, right. they go off, back but on. they start eating food, and they, they put it all back There's on. some major tragedies here. Some people gain back the weight they lose almost immediately. That's probably not good for you physically. Is no, it? it isn't good for you at all. And 50% gained back all the way within 18 months. And the long-term term statistics, which are starting to come in now, are pretty discouraging. It's looking like these statistics are about the same as it's been for all diets in the last 30 years. About 95% of the people who go on these diets will gain back most of all of their weight Why? in five years. Why? Well, they really aren't learning how to change their bad habits. You see, yeah. this liquid diet, the liquid diet portion is great. You lose weight very rapidly. It's relatively safe if it's uh, medically supervised, and uh, it's very effective. However, when you come off the fast, what are you going to do different this time that you haven't done in the past? Yeah, you never learn any new habits. Yeah, so it's like changing your foundation. Well, in many ways it is. Yes, yeah. you have to change some habits that have developed for many, many years in your life. Actually, all your life. They all have become chronic dieters. All right, we are a nation of chronic dieters. That's Why is that? What do we do wrong? Well, first of all, we're obsessed with weight control. I guess we have a lot of idle time to be worried about the size and shape of our bodies, and it's become a major topic that in our lifetime, at least, uh, we've basically been encompassed by it and just obsessed with weight since we, were, since we were born. We're also taught a lot of bad things. We're taught from a very young age that dieting is a way to control weight. As a matter of fact, statistics are showing us that we're getting fatter as a nation, so clearly what we're doing is not working. So then what is the right thing? Well, the right thing to do... And... The right thing to do is to become a natural eater, to get back in touch with the signals that the body gives in a natural way. Our body tells us when we're hungry, and our body also tells us when we're comfortably satisfied with food, which is a concept called satiety, different than being stuffed or full. Most of us learn, even from childhood, the wrong way to eat. Well, you remember your mother saying everything on you, your plate. Well, that's stuffing yourself. Right. But how about when your mom says to you an hour before dinner when you're uh, feeling hungry, don't eat, honey, uh, dinner's coming in an hour. She's yeah. asking you to deny your hunger. Then we go on diets. Uh, most people start diets when they're in their teens. 80% uh, of high school teenage girls have been on diet, really? and 50% of boys. So we already learn to ignore hunger as a signal and start to think in our brains about the various things that we should or should not be eating, whether we've been good or bad today, and how many calories we've consumed. Well, the doctor, though, has a couple of really good plans. First of all, you say rate your 